two trees. Grant me, Lord, the words that you want me to speak, because, Lord, uh, this is your word, the Bible, <coughs> and not ours. So we pray that you grant us a discerning ears to hear and to then, um, as you affirm your word to us, to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, today will be a bit different uh, because I'm telling a story, a tale of two trees. For, for the previous weeks, we have been looking at um, certain cultural artifacts of every week, a, a different cultural artifact of uh, the ancient Near East. Uh, this time, we're going to be looking at something, the, the same kind of things, but from a different way of looking at it, from this story of the Bible, how the Bible talks about these two trees. So we begin from the very beginning, of course, as I continue to admit people into the Zoom meeting. Okay, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. So the Bible begins with a desert, a wasteland, without form and void, darkness, and the ocean, the deep, right? Now you're going to ask me, well, is it a desert or is it an ocean? You're missing the point, all right? These are all um, words or other images of uncreation, right? Of course, with the modern language, it will be nothing. But nothing is so abstract that even modern physicists couldn't grasp the meaning of nothing, right, without a thing to the extent that some uh, physicists uh, made the error of saying things like, nothing is inherently unstable. No, nothing is not inherently unstable. Nothing is without a thing, okay? So there's nothing to be unstable about the nothing. You know what I mean? So uh, sometimes they reify the word nothing that it means something. So it's not a very easy concept. So the Bible talks about this instead of talking about nothing and something, talks about the state of uncreation and the state of creation, right? The state whereby it is non-flourishing to the state of flourishing. And so we have these three uh, phrases that talks about um, uncreation. We have total wasteland, pure darkness, and only the sea. Right? This, is, this is not the human realms, the, not the realm of human flourishing. Wasteland, the desert, is not the realm of human flourishing. Darkness is not the realm of human flourishing. Right? And there's only the sea. That's not the realm of human flourishing. And um, from there, we go to the end of the Bible. In Revelation 21, we have, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, and there will be no night there, right? So correspondingly, at the end of the Bible, in the beginning we have God created the heavens and the earth, and at the end, there is, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And instead of the total wasteland, we have the New Jerusalem. Uh, instead of pure darkness, there is no more night. Night is banished. And only the sea, to the sea was no more. The sea was banished. And so we can say that the whole Bible is about a movement. A movement from total wasteland to garden city, right? From pure darkness to pure light to only the sea to only land. And uh, there is a um, way of talking about Genesis 1 and 2 that is actually not 100% accurate. We usually like to talk about in the beginning, God created the world perfect, right? It's a perfect creation. Uh, no, it's a good creation. Good, 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 very good. But perfect was not part of the vocabulary of Genesis 1 and 2. Perfection is here in Revelation 21 and 22, okay? So the Bible, actually what God is doing is that God, the, the Bible and this period of history 
is about God, God's creation progressively creating up from the total wasteland, transforming it to eventually a garden city, and uh, from pure darkness to pure light, and then only the sea to only land. So what's going on in Genesis 1 and, and 2 is not about perfect creation, but a work in progress, such that, uh, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And then there was the evening, and there was the morning. You know what I mean? Let there be light, and there was light. And God called the light day, and called the darkness night. So God didn't banish darkness in Genesis chapter 1. Neither did he, ba nor did he banish the, the sea. Okay? Dry land appeared, and the dry land he called earth, right? And the waters he called sea. So it is a 50-50 kind of a thing. You know what I mean? Actually, less than 50-50 ocean, you know what I mean? There's a lot more. Okay, so, and then God planted a garden, a microcosm of perfection. All right? Planted a microcosm of perfection here. All right? So why is the world the way it is? It's because we are still on a journey from God's from, from chaos into order, right? This is whole, the whole story of creation. So God's creation shouldn't be thought of in the sense that ding, 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 happens like that, all right? But rather, it is like a, 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 a canvas, and then pour, or, or rather like my children's toys, right, Lego. You throw all the Lego pieces, and then you, you slowly mold, and you mold, and you mold, and you build, and you build, and you build what was the gold and dalium and onyx stones scattered around the river, all right, into a builded city in the new Jerusalem. You get it? All right? It's a construction site. And God, in his wisdom, some, at some point of his, this, this story, he introduced hum, human beings. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over all the earth, to subdue the earth, meaning that the earth is, um, by default, a wasteland, right? The earth is by default a wasteland, and here you have the garden, you live in this garden, and then you, 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 as you grow and you multiply, you subdue the earth, because the earth will fight back if you don't subdue it, right? Any one of you who have a garden knows what I'm talking about, right? You don't spend enough time with your garden, the, the the garden fights back, right? So you need to subdue the earth so that you can turn chaos into order. And so God has been doing that for uh, six days plus and uh, transforming chaos into order and give it just enough, all right, that all the raw material, all the basic blueprint is all there. Okay, there is all the species are there. There is the durian tree and there's all, all right, and then put the humans there, there and then say, okay, now I want to continue this project through human beings. Whatever the reason was, <laughs> okay? Doesn't sound like a great idea to me, but God knows best. Okay, so says that, okay, now I'm going to bring this to completion through these human beings. So the human vocation is to partner with God in this creative process, right? He is the foreman, he came here, he did it all by himself, halfway, right? And then hired workers, I suppose, to extend this morning's metaphor, right? Hired workers to continue that project of building this perfection, you see? Okay? Now, then, in order for us to be image bearers of God, for God to for have these human beings to do what he does, he needs to equip human beings with something. And among those things that he equip human beings with is choice. You can choose to do it this way, right? Or you can choose to go against God's the idea of what is good, right? And work against God's interests and human's own interests, and return creation 
back to formless and void. So human beings is given the choice whether they want to partner with God in this project of ruling over the earth in such a way that is good in the eyes of God so that the, the creation will progress towards what it eventually ought to end up to be. Okay, God's final goal for creation. So that is represented by the two trees. Out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden for a good reason, right? The tree that's in the middle of the garden, the highlight of the garden is the tree of life. So it is obvious that God wants human beings to partake of the tree of life to say that I surrender my, my wisdom to God. I will not rule over the earth by my own wisdom, by my own understanding of how things ought to be. I will take God's principles. I will take God's ideas as my own. He will be my life. I will depend on him. I am in the image of God. Or the, the other path and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So you can see this kind of like, in the midst of the tree was the, in the midst of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Kind of like an, as an aside, right? Which is what God is not highlighting. God is not highlighting this. God is highlighting the tree of life. But the choice is yours. You can rule over the earth against God's will. And so, that is why we are in the situation that we find ourselves today. Anyhow, moving on, Galatians, uh, Galatians, Genesis 2, 15 to 16. The Lord God took the human, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Doesn't explain why. Okay, that's not what's so bad about it. Is it poisonous? In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Just take God's word for it. God has defined things and said that this is out of bounds for you. All right. Will you follow me? If you follow me, together we will partner, to partner in a covenant to bring the, the creation to its completion. All right? So creation is actually incomplete. God rested from his works, that's true, okay? But the completion, the perfection is here. But here we have a microcosm called the Garden of Eden and say that human beings, now you know what is good, now you know exactly what I want, all right? Enlarge this Garden of Eden so that it fills up the whole earth, so that the whole thing will be a garden city. Will you participate with me in this project? The choice is yours. And so, if you do it God's way, we'll end up here. If you do it against God's way, way then you are pulling creation back to formless and void. Okay? Every lie we tell, we are pulling creation back to chaos. Right? We're putting our relationships in jeopardy. Every time we sin against God, we are introducing chaos into God's world. We are moving backwards <laughs> instead of forwards. Okay, so that's the deal. That's the story. Then comes Genesis chapter 3. The serpent said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? God planted all these delicious fruits, uh, tree, fruit trees and said that, ha, huh, you can just see but not touch. <laughs> right? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So she knew God's commandment. She, a lot of people think that, you know, well, if human beings were, before they committed sin, they didn't have the knowledge of good and evil, then how could they be held culpable? The knowledge of good and evil is not about knowing what is right and wrong per se, because before that, anything that God commands is good. Anything that God forbids is not good. So their paradigm of good and evil came from God. 
and so she's able to repeat exactly what is good and what is bad according to God's definition. The knowledge of good and evil is the ability to define for yourself what is right and wrong. Okay, God says something, I'll have to make a decision on whether what God says is right or wrong or not. Okay, I have my own version of what is good and evil, right and wrong. Okay, and the history of the world is just full of these examples of human beings says, well, yes, God has a set of what is good and bad, what is right and wrong. All right, well, that's what God says. And here is my addition all right, of what is good and evil, right and wrong. I'm going with this. She's innocent of sin, but she knows what sin is. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God. Now I have explained why I prefer the King James Version in translating. And you will be like gods. And I will, you will be like one of us, like gods. All right? Knowing good and evil. You will get to define and determine for yourself. You don't need to be an image bearer. You'll be a free agent. Okay, on the matter of right and wrong. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she stretched out her hands, she took off its fruit, she ate, she gave some to her husband, who was with her because he wanted to eat it, but he didn't want to be the first one to break God's command. Okay. And he ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, Mazot Asit, what is this that you have done? Mazot Asit. So we have a few terminologies that are very interesting. We have C. Okay. Or various conjugations of it. All right. C, saw, sin. C. We have good for food. Okay? Si, ra, a. Good, tov. Uh, we have tuk, la, kach. We have gave, natan. Natan. And then we have, what is it that you have done? All right. So, these are words that we're going to see over and over again. You see something, it's good in your eyes. Right? See something, good according to your own definition. In your eyes, that's what it means, right? Good in your eyes. So you stretch out your hand, you take, you eat, and you gave someone else to eat. Okay, so after the fall, God came up and said to Adam, Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, okay, listen to the voice <laughs> of your wife, bad idea, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. Instead of blessing, that brings in the curse. Instead of moving this way, you are moving us back that way. You, you get what I mean? Okay. You bring a curse is the ground because of you. Your job is to bring creation this way, okay? But you are leading creation back to formless and void. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So, God... The Lord God said, Behold, the human being has become like one of us. He agrees. All right? That's why I would translate it as to be like gods, like one of us, in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand, so reach out. Now, reach out is the same word for sun. Okay? Uh, why? Because when you or stretch forth your hand, because I guess when you stretch forth your hand, that is to send, 
like that, right? So that is the same, same word to send for, to stretch out your hand, okay? Uh, yeah. Of also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, God sent him out. <laughs> so instead of pre to prevent the human being from reaching out, God sent them out, same, same word, all right? Shalach. All right? Instead of allowing them to shalach and eat, he shalach them out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He was banished. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. But all this is not before God tells the human being what this whole story is now going to be about from now on. From now on, the story is like this. The Lord God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. She shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Theologians call this passage the Protovangelion. The Protovangelion means the first preaching of the gospel. Uh, yeah, kind of, but it's more than that, all right? What this is saying is that from now on, the story of the Bible is going to be for all generations an enmity between your offspring, okay, and her offspring. That means not just between the woman and the serpent in the garden, all right, but for all generations, there is going to be a struggle between humanity and the serpent. The serpent is not a rival to God. As I said the last time, we always think of, you know, God versus Satan, all right? As Satan is a rival to God. No, he's not. He's a rival to humanity. You see? Okay, he's a creature of God, but a rival to humanity. So there's going to be a tussle between image bearers, okay, and this perversion of it. And there's going to be a fight. The human will bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel, right? They've allied together. They have joined forces to rebel against God, but there is no honor among thieves, right? They're going to fight among themselves as well. You shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. Now, this tells us that this is how to read the rest of the Bible. The rest of the Bible should be read, okay, in the context of where is the human, where is the serpent, how did they fight? What is the result of the fight? You see, this passage sets the program for the rest of the Bible. So then you turn to the next page to Cain and Abel, right? You want to determine, okay, who is the image bearer? Where is the serpent? Right? The beast inside is what's going on, right? The beast inside. Sin is like a crouching beast within you. He's trying to have you, okay? But you need to rule over it. And by giving into it and bringing in death, right? That is that story. So Cain and Abel is a repeat of this story. Noah is a repeat. Every story of the Bible is a repeat of this story. And it is to that that I want to go. It is like what I say in the first session on the fifth symphony. This is one of the dun 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 dun, right? And as you go, and you need to look for the next dun 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 dun. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying. Okay, so, so therefore, this is, this is a symphony, and every time we come to the Bible, one of the first things we need to ask ourselves is this, how is this a permutation of the Garden of Eden story? How is this a permutation of the two trees? Thus, the title, A Tale of Two Trees. So we're going to begin with Father Abraham, <laughs> okay? Father Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abraham, the whole world has gone into chaos. I'm going to create a new Adam. I'm going to have a new humanity. And Abraham, you are going to be the new Adam. You are going to be the new human who obey me. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. Go, go out, go out. All right? It's a
in Egypt. For the, and here's the reason. For the famine was severe in the land. It's a test. Now when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarah, his voice, listen to my voice. Okay, so he said to Sarah, his wife, listen to my voice. So the role kind of swapped around between uh, Adam and Eve and between Abraham and Sarai. I know that you are a woman beautiful, the same word, tov. You are tov, right? You are tova, the feminine version. You are tova in appearance. And when the Egyptians, when they ra'ah, when they see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me. They're going to be Cain, all right? And, I'm, and I'll be able in this story, and it's because of you, because you are pretty, and in their eyes, when they see you, they're going to take you. They will kill me, they will let you live. Okay? Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. You see, the test is always like this. The, why did God make, <laughs> God make, why was the tree of knowledge of good and evil so attractive? Because it's a task. Imagine if it is the tree of life that's super attractive, all right, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil is like absolutely rotten. Nobody will ever choose the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What kind of a task is that? <laughs> you know what I mean? If, your, if God's will is always aligned to your will, there's no task. There's only a task when God's will is not in line with your will. Your will and God's will contradict. We like to pray, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth. But what if you don't like God's will? Can you still pray, <laughs> right? You see, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, the tree of life looks boring. The tree of life looks like not very alive. It looks like death. Whereas the tree of death, <laughs> the tree of knowledge of good and evil, looks very alive. You see what I mean? It seems that I will prosper, I will flourish with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's what Eve thought. If I have the fruit of this tree, then I will flourish. But God said, yeah, it may look that you will flourish, but you won't. Obey me. Go through this not very attractive path, Okay, and there you will find eternal life. That's the test. The test of hearing God's voice or depending on what is good in your eyes. What is good in our eyes? The tree of knowledge of good and evil every time. Otherwise, why we sin? Okay, the tree of life, not as attractive. And so, Abraham, Abraham here, he says that, you see, why am I asking you to do this? He has a logic. He's not just being all evil. You know what I mean? His logic is that, that it may go well with me because of you and that my life be spared for your sake. If we tell them the truth, I will die. Right? If we follow God's will, it will be to my detriment. If we follow God's command, I, it will be to my detriment. If we veer away from God's command, then I will be preserved. That's the test. God's command is, listen to me. Whatever the circumstances look like, listen to me. And so, when Abraham entered Egypt, the Egyptians indeed saw that the woman was beautiful. They saw she was good, very good in her appearance. And when the princess of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken, right, and was given to Pharaoh. Sarah was the forbidden fruit. How many times must it, must, must it repeat in that passage that she is your wife? He is someone else's wife, right? She is the forbidden fruit. Who is the human that is being tempted? Pharaoh. 
Who is the serpent? Abraham. Okay, this is a very inverted way of form of dun 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 dum. <laughs> right here, Abraham plays the role of the serpent with his wife as the fruit, forbidden fruit, and Pharaoh is the one that has to make a decision. And so, well, Pharaoh made a decision. So the Lord afflicted, struck Pharaoh and his houses with his house with great plagues, anticipating what's going to happen. Some chapters down the road, <laughs> right? Uh, with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So he suffered pain. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, Ma as mazot asita. What is this you have done to me? So Pharaoh is now in the place of God, exposing the human. What is this that you have done? All right? So now the role reversal back. Abraham is the human who chose the wrong tree, so to speak, all right? who chose the path of knowledge of, who sees for himself the knowledge of good and evil. And then Pharaoh is now speaking with the voice of God because Pharaoh and God is now have the same will because God said, hey, you took someone's wife. I didn't know. Okay, well, then do something about it. So Pharaoh is now executing God's will. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's now in line. Pharaoh is 100% in line with God's will. And then, so saying in the voice of God, Ma asita, ma asita, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why didn't you say that she's the forbidden fruit? Why did you say she's my sister? Why did you lie? So that I took her for my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go, all right? The same verse, word go, right? The last word that Pharaoh tells, <laughs> the last word that Pharaoh tells Abram is the first word that God tells Abram, go, all right? And so now, Pharaoh gave all men orders concerning him and the shalach sent him away, exiled him, all right, back into Eden. <laughs> this is a reverse exile, okay? Out uh, from Egypt back into the land of Israel. Huh? The genius of the Bible? <laughs> Who wrote this stuff? Okay. So this is telling us that Abraham was replaying the story of Adam and Eve in the garden and in his first test he failed. That is Abraham's story. So then since Abraham failed the test, God gives several tests. And one of the tests is delaying the fulfillment of the promise until they are well advanced in age. And so, Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. God has promised them a son. And now, until now, they have no children. She had a female Egyptian servant. Egyptian, Egyptian servant, you, you, you get the idea now, all right? She's forbidden. Right? A female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now, blaming God, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Instead of this is a test from the Lord, we need to stay faithful. Go in, go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. So instead of relying on God's wisdom to rule, they decided to rule over their slave girl, right, by abusing her, you see, according, and then it's not that they are like, I'm all evil, I'm all evil. It is that they have an internal logic, you see. They have their own version of what is good and evil, right and wrong. Say, so God has promised us a child. Well, that hasn't happened yet. Let us help God, right, in fulfilling that promise. So with their own wisdom, okay, they committed this. And Abram listened to the voice of his wife, Sarai, all right? So the echo from, Gen from the Garden of Eden is right here. So after Abraham had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abraham's wife, Abraham's actual wife, to tell you how wrong this is, took Hagar, okay? Took Hagar, Lakach, her servant, the Hagar the Egyptian, 
her servant and gave her to Abraham, her husband. Right? To tell you how wrong this is. As a wife. So he went into Hagar. Again, no, no dialogue on Abraham's side. Just as no dialogue on Adam's side. Right? Adam has no dialogue, no lines here. All right? Abraham has no lines here. Just follow the voice of the wife. And she conceived. And then after that, Sarai said to Abraham, May the wrong done to me be on you. May the Lord judge between you and me. So Abraham said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your hand. All right? Your servant is in your power. Literally, your servant is your hand. Do to her according that which is good in your eyes. That's literally what it says. Okay? Do to her as you please. And so what did Sarai do? Sarai dealt harshly with her. The next time this word gets repeated is how the Egyptian pharaoh dealt with Israel. All right? So it's a payback for Sarah's sin, or the same kind of sin. Dealt harshly with her, and she got exiled from the Garden of Eden. <laughs> right? So that, that, that story, but then this, this time, this, this, this addition of dun 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 is so inverted, <laughs> right? That, uh, uh, that uh, the, the victim was the one that got chased out from the land. Okay, so, so much for Father Abraham. Okay, and two generations later, Leah saw Ra'ah that she had ceased bearing children, the same theme, bearing children, bearing children, bearing children, right? The same theme. She took her servant Zilpah, same story, right? As what Sarah did, and gave her to Jacob as a wife. And again, Jacob here, being like Adam, the forefather, like Abraham, the grandfather, all right, said nothing. Then Leah, servant, Zilpah, bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, good fortune has come. All right, so that's a judgment. That is her understanding of what is right and wrong. What is good and evil. She thought that this is good. What she did was the right thing to do. So she called his name God. God means good fortune. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, happy I am. Asheri. So she called his name Asher, which means happy. Right? She thought that she's doing God's will. You know what I mean? But she is actually transgressing God's will. And this is basically how to read every story of the Bible. It is always a tale of two, almost said cities, a tale of two trees, <laughs> okay? And there is a test to see whether you will obey God and have God's wisdom as your wisdom, or you will branch out on your own <laughs> and do your own thing to redefine good and evil for yourself. If you follow God, life. If you don't follow God, death. If you follow God, new Jerusalem, new heaven and new earth. If, one step towards there. If you disobey God, then one step backwards to formless and void, back into the abyss, into the chaos. And there, if you ultimately disobey, there is where you will end up for all eternity. So then moving forward with the children of Israel, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven to you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. The first test is always the test of eating, okay? That I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So from Exodus uh, 15 onwards, since coming out from 16 onwards, since coming out from the Red Sea, all right, all the way to before the tabernacle, that whole thing is about test. The word test repeats all over the place and it governs the whole section. So God wants to test them about the bread from heaven. Would you obey me and eat this food? All right? Or would you want to have your own thing? Again, their own thing are tasty stuff. The leeks, the pots of meat, the garlic, 
the, those stuff, right? And what is this? Exactly, that's the name, mana. What is this? They call this, is this worthless food, <laughs> right? In numbers, right? This worthless food. But this is the bread of life. This is the bread of heaven. Those tasty food leads you into slavery in Egypt. This heavenly food leads you into Jerusalem. You get it? Into the promised land. So which food would you have? Again, the more attractive one is the highway to hell, right? Whereas the boring looking, not very inspiring looking one, okay, is the one that leads into eternal life because God said so. So which one would you obey? That is the test. Repeatedly, they failed the test. Eventually, they made it to Mount Sinai. So God appeared to Moses at Mount Sinai. Then Moses told the words of the, peop words of the people to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. The third day is always a day of testing, a day of decision. All right, a uh, 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 kairos now, all right, the third day. From on the, for on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people, and you shall set limits for the people all around. I've already covered the mountain of God, all right? God is going to make that place the Garden of Eden. You see, all right, he's going to come down. You shall set limits for the people all around, saying, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it, not yet. Because whoever touches the mountain these three days shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. Now, when the trumpet sounds, oh, wait for it, wait for it. When the trumpet sounds, a long blast. Ba -ba, a long blast, when you hear the shofar do that, they shall come up to the mountain. Okay? God's goal, right? God's instruction is that they will come up to the mountain. But you have just told them, don't touch it, don't, 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 don't. in the day they eat, touch it, okay, you shall surely die, right? Okay, that looks like the path of death, for sure. Don't do it until you hear the trumpet blast. Once you hear the trumpet blast, you can come up. Okay, so the people say, okay, let's do it. So the third day arrived. The third day arrived when all the people saw the thunder and flashes of lightning and the sound of trumpet, ba -ba, but the mountain was smoking, it's a volcano. Right? So it's time to go up. And you hear the trumpet sound louder and louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. Come up, come up, come up, come up, come up. The people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us. We will listen. Don't let God speak to us lest we die. So if, we, if God speaks to us, if we go up now, we will die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you. It's a test. Going up into the volcano, yeah, that looks like certain death. But it is God who say, come up. So, even though it looks like the path of death, we should follow God and go up the mountain. The people said, no. That doesn't look like human flourishing to me. <laughs> okay? <laughs> that doesn't look like. So, the people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God is. Fast forward a few chapters. Then Moses went up on the mountain. The cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days. And on the Sabbath, he called to Moses out the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire. And the word is eating. Right? It's an like eating fire. It's the same fire that Moses saw at the burning bush that the fire was on the bush, on the tree. The fire was on the tree, just like the flaming sword was guarding the tree of life. All right? The fire was on the tree, but the tree was not eaten. That's the, that's the literal word. The tree was not eaten. Oh, there is a way to coexist with the fire of God, such that you don't get consumed. Okay? So Moses has learned all of that. And so he called out to Moses in the midst of the cloud. The appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. He went into the Garden of Eden. That is how success looks like. Success looks like, it looks like certain death, 
but because it is God who caused me to eat, it's a volcano, I'm going to throw myself into the mouth of the volcano. <laughs> the tree of knowledge of good and evil is that according to my logic, all right, going up there is not flourishing at all. Going up there is death. I am going to stay away. Moses says, this is a test from the Lord. Come with me. Nobody does. Only one person did. Who is he? The representative of Israel. So the solution to Israel's failure is to have one representative of Israel to go up on the mountain and take on what is death. And from that, taking on of what is death comes eternal life. That's that story. So then, Moses, before he dies, in Deuteronomy 30, he said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've said before you life and death, blessing and curse. There's life, there's death. There's blessing, there's curse. So choose life. <laughs> right? Choose life that you and your offspring may live loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice. Where is his voice? His voice is in his word. Obey his word. Obey his voice. Holding fast to him, for he is your life. You depend on him. God is the tree of life that you eat to partake and depend on. And on him you live. And the length of your days. That is why Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man. I said for you, blessing and curse. Well, what kind of person will be blessed? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, stands not in the way of sinners, sits not in the seat of scoffers, but he delights in the word of the Lord. He delights in the law of the Lord. He delights in God's word, in God's voice, in God's commandments. And on his law, he meditates day and night. And he, what does he look like? He looks like the tree of life. <laughs> okay, he looks like the tree of life. If you choose God's word, you will be like a tree planted by rivers. Isn't that the garden scene? The scene from the garden of Eden, of, of Eden right? The tree, the river, the tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, its leaf does not weather. You will be the tree of life, supplying others if you meditate on the word of God. And so God tells Joshua the same thing. Do not depart from the law, neither to the left, neither to the right. Then everything you do will prosper, right? That is the path of life. And so Joshua led the people into the Holy Land and they fought war. They fought a war against Jericho and they're going to fight against Ai. And then we have this guy. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. Devoted things. Contrabands, all right? Forbidden fruit. For Achan, the son of Kami, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took, took, he lakach, some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Dun, 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 dun. And then, tried to look for the culprit. Eventually, they found the culprit. Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel. Give praise to him. Now tell me, Ma'asita. <laughs> right? What is this? that you have done. Tell me now, do not hide it from me. Don't hide. <laughs> Don't hide behind the bushes. Don't hide in your, in your, in your leaf. Right? Ekel answered Joshua as answering Yehoshua. <laughs> Interesting. Truly, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I did. I saw, I didn't highlight the word I should have, I saw among the spoil a beautiful, right? A beautiful cloak from where? From Babylon, from Shina, from the Tower of Babel place. <laughs> okay? And so I coveted and I took. It doesn't belong to me. It's, a for, it's forbidden to me, but it's pretty. It looks like it's going to look good on my wife. <laughs> right? So he took it and that's that story. 
So we need another Moses, right? We need another representative of Israel. The next big representative of Israel is David. David, he, the last time we talked about serpent, how he slayed the serpent, right? He crushed the serpent's head. He defeated Goliath, that serpentine beast, right? And uh, with all the armor of, okay, so he is supposed to be the snake crusher. Again, he crushed the serpent on the outside. He couldn't crush the serpent on the inside. And so 2 Samuel 11, verse 2 to 4, David saw from the roof a woman bathing. All right? Some kind of a fruit. Is it a kosher food? Fruit for him? Okay. Well, don't care because she was very beautiful. Okay? You, you see what I mean? She was tova in his eyes. So David shalach, he sent, stretched out his hand, right? He sent and inquired about the woman. Who is this woman? Is she kosher to me? One of them said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? She is forbidden fruit. David said, I don't care. All right? I'm going to stretch out my hand. I sent messengers, took her. She came to him and he lay with her. All right? The seed of woman. David. The Messiah, the seed of woman. Oh, like mother, like son. <laughs> okay, did <laughs> exactly the same kind of sin there. And so, we have the struggle of the Bible. Which way do you go? Two ways to live. Not even the best of men could withstand the temptation. A man after God's heart can't do it. Oh, we need a, another David. All right, we need a new David. And so we turn on to the New Testament. The same serpent came to Jesus and said, if you are the son of God, let's talk about eating again. Let's go back to the original temptation. All right, tell these stones to become bread. That looks like flourishing. Yeah, it does look like flourishing. What's wrong with that? What harm does that bring? Who gets hurt if the son of God turns bread into loaves? The answer is, well, it doesn't matter. What matters is that did God command that? And Jesus says, I don't hear God commanding that. Man shall not live on bread alone, but man eats the word of God. Right? Man do not just live on, man eats the word of God. Every word that comes out from the mouth of the Lord. God has not commanded me to do this. I won't do it. So by doing that, he overcame the original temptation. Again, the devil took him to a high, very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the splendor, the counter mountain. All right? The counter mountain. All this I will give you. I will, I will give you. I will give you. The, the, I will give you. That's what you came here to do for. You came here for the kingdoms of the world. You came here to recover the kingdoms of the world. Don't need so hard, I give you. If you bow down and worship me, that's the forbidden fruit, the kingdoms of the world. The forbidden fruit is that, yes, Jesus, you are going to inherit the kingdoms of the world, but not this way, not in this manner. Jesus says, away from me, serpent. Away from me, Satan. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus overcame the test of two trees. But comes the ultimate test. When his will, when God's will does not necessarily align to his own interest in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said to his disciples, sit here, I go over to, there to pray. He said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. It, this feels like death. This doesn't feel like flourishing to me. <laughs> right? If I just look with my own eyes, this looks like terrible stuff, something I should avoid. Remain here, watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible that this can be done some other way, all right, let's go for some other way. 
I know what your will is, but you know, Father, if you can do this in a different way, okay, let's do that. Now that becomes a test. If your will, if God's will is always 100% aligned to your will, there's no test, all right? It is precisely because there is uh, uh, some difference between what God wants and what you, what you want, all right? That, that Jesus pray, not as I will, but as you will. In that prayer at Gethsemane, three times, Jesus aligned his human will to the divine will. Jesus aligned his human will to the divine will and said, yes, I know this is death, but I know that if I obey God's voice, what looks like death to me is eternal life. If I cease for myself the knowledge of good and evil, if I cease for myself the de- how to determine what to do, all right, though it looks like self-preservation, it looks like I get to live longer, that is the highway to hell for the whole world. <laughs> That's the test. And therefore, as we look on the cross, as, as we sing, O mighty cross, love lifted high, the Lord of life, raised there to die, his sacrifice on Calvary has made the mighty cross a tree of life to me, the mighty cross, because he took on death according to God's will that releases the tree of life for the rest of us. And Jesus says, you do that as well. Enter by the narrow gate. Two ways to live. The gate is wide, the way is easy, that leads to destruction. Those who enter by it are many. The gate that is narrow, the way that is hard, that leads to life. Those who find it are few. And just as I will take on the cross, so you also take on your cross. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. Deny yourself of what is right and wrong. Deny yourself of what is your logic and whatever it is. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me to certain death. For whoever would save his life, you think that that is flourishing, you will lose it. You lose your life, you think that that is perishing, but but it is for my sake, I'm telling you to do it, you will find life. It is the tale of two trees, is this seemingly contradiction. By the way, Abraham passed the test, eventually. The father, God told him, to bring your son, your only son. And he stated that this is a test. God tested him. Go up and offer him as a sacrifice. And Abraham saw and he took and about as he about to slay his child. All right? God stopped him. Abraham, Abraham, don't sacrifice your son. I don't like people sacrificing their son. I will sacrifice my son. Because this mountain is the same mountain I will provide. The substitute for your son. And all our sons and daughters. And the author of Hebrews says, you know, it must be the case that Abraham was thinking, if I kill my son, God is going to raise him up from the dead. That's exactly it. Resurrection. That's exactly it. And so today, how do we live? Those who live according to the flesh, according to what we think is right and wrong, set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And it is counterintuitive, right? Because the first thing it when something happens, the first thing is the flesh screams out something to do. We have that song, right? The flesh, by flesh, just screams out the thing to do, okay? And here's the trick, all right? What, do, what should we do in those situations? The trick is do everything that is against what your flesh wants, <laughs> okay? Chances are that's the will of God because your flesh cannot please God. 
This is every day we stand before two trees. Few times a day we stand before the two trees to make a decision. On ostensibly, something looks very attractive, enticing, life-giving. That's death. Counterintuitively, this book that looks absolutely boring with small fonts. This is life. And so Jesus, every time, every 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 Sunday when we come together, Jesus, he he took bread. After blessing it according to God's will, Barukata Adonai Elohenu Melecha Olem Hamotzi Lachem in Haaretz. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and says, "Take, eat. This is my body." He took a cup. When he gave thanks, he gave it to them, saying, "Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Don't eat that. Don't eat what the world gives you. Eat what I give you. Take it. Eat it." In another place, Jesus explains a little. I am the living bread. I am the manna, the test, the test that the Israelites were experiencing. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give him, give that I will give for the life of the world, is my flesh. The Jew said, "How can this man give us his flesh to eat?" Jesus said, "No, of course I am not." What? But he said first, "Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall have no life in you." Are you saying that this bread, this this bread that we eat, is his flesh? And then this cup that we drink is his blood. What is going on? So Jesus says, "No, no, no! It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh <laughs> is of no help at all. all. Right? Eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. No, the 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 physical flesh, the bread, is of no use at all. It is the Spirit that gives life. And what is that? The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. It's the word." Blessed is the man who meditates on the law of the Lord. Choose life. Obey the voice of the Lord. So, are you also going to leave the tree of life? Are you also going to send yourself into exile? I'm the tree of life. Simon Peter answered, "Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life." So, as we meditate on His word every day. We are being transformed into His likeness, and as we are being transformed into His likeness, we are moving step by step closer and closer to the New Jerusalem, where, as was read this morning by Paget, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, the Garden of Eden, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, no more, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Where are you in the decisions of your life? Do the decisions you make move closer this way, or the decisions you make just turns the world, your world, your family, your community, your neighborhood, your country, and the world? Back into formless and voice void, the reverse of God's creation. Or is your presence in your family life, in among your friends, your colleague, your office, a tree of life that leads people flowing into eternal life, flowing into the garden city where there is no more night, and the sea is no more. The tale of the whole Bible is the tale of our lives as well, a tale of two trees. Okay, I'll stop here. I can take questions. Yep, the microphone so that the people online can hear. Uncle Kim Shah. Yeah. Ah, ah, uh, speaking to it.
Okay, I'm just wondering. Uh, Jesus said, your will, not my will, be done, right? Uh, also, I know uh, the Lord Jesus Christ learned obedience through what he suffered. But at that point of time, we also know that Jesus Christ is truly God, truly man. So if you were to do otherwise, has he that right? Because he's truly God. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's would a... there be another plan? Yeah, so was it possible for uh, Jesus to sin? There are two views about it, that Jesus can sin, but he will not sin. That seems to be right, the way I think. So the way I think about the natures, the two natures of Christ, very controversial. A man by the name of Andrew Lok in Hong Kong Baptist University is working on this exact problem. Um, he's a Singaporean, Andrew Lok. Um, he's looking at um, the divinity of Christ, the humanity of Christ is, how do I put it? He has a consciously, he has a human consciousness. He has a human consciousness, but a divine subconscious. So in his consciousness, he's always human, such that when he was a baby, he has the consciousness of a baby, all right? And when he was a young boy, he has the consciousness of a young boy. So that when he went to Torah school to learn the alphabets, to learn the alphabet, he was actually learning the alphabet instead of being very, instead of being polite to his, to his teacher, all right? I said, actually, I inspired all this stuff. He, he saw that he was actually learning Hebrew. He never knew Chinese, that kind of stuff, okay? So he grew up with that. And, and which means that he has been reading the Torah, thinking that, wouldn't it be nice if in my generation the Messiah comes, you know? <laughs> right? And then it is a slow realization. And Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God. That means he grew spiritually, okay? And with man, he made friends. And so he eventually came to the, I think this is me, right? So throughout his life, he always had a human consciousness. But the divine subconscious at the right time would erupt into his consciousness to reveal God's will to him on a need-to-know basis. Such that when Jesus says, when I come back, I can't tell you, all right? I don't know. The Son of Man doesn't know. And angels do not know. Only my Father in heaven knows. Some theologians, some interpreters say, this is because this shows the humility of Christ. Wrong. It doesn't show the humility. If that was what's going on, that, then Jesus was a hypocrite. At best, a liar at worst, right? He actually knew and said, no lie, no lie, I don't know, right? So, that, so he must be the case that he genuinely didn't know. How can he be truly God if he didn't know? So the answer must be, he knows it in his subconscious, but it's not that in his consciousness. And on this particular knowledge, the divine subconscious chose not to reveal this information to his consciousness, such that every miracle that Jesus makes is an act of faith. Right, that God told him to do, and he did so, and God did not tell him to turn the bread, the, the so into bread, so he didn't. Right, so he make before the miracle, he prays, and that also explained prayer. This was Jesus talking to himself. What's going on? He's aligning his human consciousness to the command of the divine subconscious. All right, and that was what was going on in the Garden of Gethsemane. That on the cross, all right, there was absolutely nothing. The divine subconscious prom that has always enjoyed his whole life was radio silence, such that it is a complete act of total faith and surrender to the will of God. What would you do even if God is silent? You say, God, I have enough. All right, I have enough. I'm going to come down from the cross now. Right? No, he didn't do that. So, therefore, he was tempted in every way that we are as we were tempted, meaning that the temptations in the wilderness were true, real temptations. He wasn't Clark Kent disguising as Superman. Or Superman disguising as Clark Kent, all right? And when you shoot at him, then he, wow, he, he dodged, 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 actually everything that can one. Right? He's just pretending to dodge, all right? So no, the temptations were real. And I was telling a group last week exactly about this, that when he was growing up, you know, as a teenager, hormones must be raging all in his body. Because if there were hormones raging in his body, how could he have been tempted in every way that I was tempted in? <laughs> right? So, subdue the earth. So that's what Jesus did. Thanks for that, for that question. That was actually the topic I was talking about last week. Yeah. Any more questions? 
Okay, so without any, ah, we're going to have the ritual of lining up here again to, every week got ritual, you know, no question, no question, then all, all line up here. <laughs> okay, all right, let's, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that uh, your word, oh God, is so amazing. In every generation, we see the repeat of the story uh, at the, in the Garden of Eden, standing before two trees and making decision. And it's also true with our lives, every day of our lives. Lord, help us to surrender our will to you, not to seize for ourselves according to our own logic and understanding of what is flourishing, but to surrender to your will because you know best and you are working towards a new heaven and new earth and you want to partner with us as your covenant partners to bring this project to its completion, to its perfection. But sorry, Lord, for the many times where we swerve away and reintroduce chaos into your good order. Train us with your word. Work within us. Transform us. Your Holy Spirit be with us so that our minds can be set on the spirit, which is life and peace, and not on the flesh, which brings death. Even today, even after this session, as we go for lunch, and after that, the long weekend, every moment, Lord, let us, Lord, pass the test. Help us to pass the test, because your Holy Spirit knows the will of the Lord. We surrender ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.